Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. In this episode, we will discuss demographics in Ukraine, we'll revisit the demographic trends prior to the invasion, examine what happened to birth rates and population numbers due to the war that triggered a massive flow of refugees both across borders and within the country. We'll delve into the potential scenarios for the demographic situation post-conflict. Over the 30 years preceding the Russian invasion, the country lost around 8 million citizens due to various reasons. Shortly after the onset of the full-scale war, it lost almost the same number again. It's likely that not everyone who fled the conflict will return when things settle down. Let's try to assess what lies ahead for the country and its prospects for demographic recovery. I'll begin with a historical perspective, reminding us that Ukraine managed to rebuild its population after the catastrophic effects of the Second World War and the 1932-1933 famine induced by Stalin's policies. During that period, human losses among both military personnel and civilians were colossal. This significantly undermined the country's demographic potential. Quantifying population losses during that time is extremely challenging because, unlike other countries involved in the war, the Soviet Union did not conduct a post-war census. What's clear is that the Second World War interrupted natural population growth and destabilized demographic processes, including those related to marriage and family. Human losses, particularly among men in their most productive years, altered both the qualitative and quantitative age distribution of the population. Demographers' estimates are approximate, but the figures remain impressive. According to some estimates, the total losses of Ukraine's population from these two tragedies, the Holodomor and the Second World War, may amount to 12 million people, or nearly a quarter of Ukraine's entire population in the early 1940s. This figure is based on the most conservative estimates. However, immediately after the end of the Second World War, Ukraine experienced an increase in marriages, a trend typical for post-war periods. Many men returned from the battlefields of the Great War and postponed marriages were resumed. In the latter half of the 1950s, marriage rates remained high. It's commonly believed that this was linked to the continued reduction in the size of the army during that period, Additionally, after Stalin's death, rehabilitated Soviet citizens who had been repressed were released from prisons and gulag camps. This led to an increase in both marriages and birth rates. Overall, throughout the 20th century, Ukraine was characterized by a high level of marriage within its population. This particularly applied to rural areas, where the population typically upheld more conservative values. Moreover, after the Second World War, there was an increase in remarriages involving women whose husbands had died in the war and those whose marriages had dissolved due to prolonged separation. In the 1950s, Ukraine experienced relatively high birth rates. This increase continued until the 1960s, when a gradual decline in marriage rates began. The pool of eligible bachelors became depleted, although an excess of women remained. According to various estimates, after the Second World War, 10 to 15 percent of Ukrainian women by the age of 30 couldn't get married due to a lack of partners. Consequently, the birth rate from the mid-1960s was relatively low. However, over time, the birth rate continued to decline. This was linked to a gradual shift in the reproductive behavior of the population, culminating in the transition from large families to nuclear families by the 1980s-1990s. The nuclear family is one with only one or two children. Life expectancy also increased. I should add that the trends in Ukraine, once part of the Soviet Union, were not unique during that time. After the Second World War, almost all European countries experienced some form of demographic crisis. Following a brief baby boom in the late 1940s to 1950s, birth rates declined in most European nations, fluctuating while mortality rates gradually rose. For instance, until recently, women in Ukraine, like in most European countries, typically had an average of one child. Higher birth rates exist in France, the Czech Republic, and Iceland, where women typically have an average of two children. 
but let's return to the history of this issue. In the run-up to the 1990s, the era of perestroika, restructuring, began, followed by a severe economic crisis. This crisis was linked to the collapse of the planned economy, which had accumulated critical imbalances. Another reason was the shift towards capitalism, accompanied by the so-called shock therapy, a term used by government economists of that time who advocated market reforms, including price liberalization, stringent monetary policies, and heedless privatization. As a result, an absolute minority who capitalized on the situation became wealthy. However, for most of the population, the consequences were different. A decline in the population's quality of life, particularly in health and vitality. This led to a demographic crisis and depopulation. Mortality rates increased and the population's age structure became older. Since 1991, Ukraine's birth rate has annually decreased by approximately 5 to 6 percent. This decline in birth rates was connected to increased migration of Ukrainians abroad in search of work. Additionally, there was a shift in reproductive behavior, where having one child in a family became the norm. Postponing pregnancy among women of reproductive age due to the desire for education and career building also played a role. All these factors combined led to a decrease in Ukraine's population. The primary source of information about the population of any country is a population census. In independent Ukraine, only one census was conducted in 2001. The second nationwide census was planned for 2023, but was understandably cancelled after the onset of the invasion. Consequently, Ukraine hasn't conducted a population census for over 20 years. Because of this, there are widely varying estimates of migration losses. However, one can rely on approximate estimates, suggesting that in the three decades from gaining independence until the full-scale war began, we lost between 8 to 10 million people. This is a very rapid decline, and the war that has been ongoing since 2014 has played a significant role. For instance, there's data indicating that overall fertility dropped by 12% after Russia annexed Crimea and invaded eastern Ukraine in 2014. In 2021, the fertility rate stood at around 116 children per 100 women. Frankly, this is a low figure. For simple population replacement, you need at least 215 children per 100 women. As of 2021, the demographic situation in Ukraine was characterized by a mortality rate surpassing the birth rate. Even before the invasion, Ukraine witnessed an increase in illnesses the spread of chronic and infectious diseases, alongside the COVID-19 pandemic. Another reason was the significant level of workplace injuries due to ineffective labor condition supervision in the country. One of the glaring issues is the premature mortality of men. According to various estimates, 42% of young men don't live past the age of 65 and die during their working years. To put it into perspective, in neighboring Poland, a similar figure stands at 27% for men. Another demographic challenge in Ukraine is the high infant mortality rate. In 2015, the mortality rate within the first 28 days after birth was twice as high as in European countries. In 2018, the overall mortality rate among all population groups in Ukraine exceeded the birth rate by almost twofold. For every 100 deceased Ukrainians, there were 59 newborns. By 2022, the number of newborns decreased to 209,000 children, which represents a 25% drop compared to 2021. This figure did not include data from Crimea and temporarily occupied territories. Additionally, the 2022 statistics did not account for children born to Ukrainian refugees abroad due to the onset of the full-scale Russian invasion. The statistics on how many Ukrainian children were born overseas after the war began last year were not published anywhere. Furthermore, the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated these challenges. In 2021, 86,000 people died from confirmed cases of coronavirus in Ukraine. According to Ukraine's state statistics service, COVID-19 became the second leading cause of death among Ukrainians after cardiovascular diseases. 
Many families decided it was better to postpone having a child until the epidemiological situation became safer. Delaying childbirth is a common response for people during periods of upheaval in all countries. Therefore, a more telling impact of the war on childbirth in Ukraine is observed in 2023. In six months, around 94,000 children were born in Ukraine, nearly a third less than during the equivalent pre-war period in 2021. This decline is significant, yet a drop in birth rates during wartime is expected in conditions of constant danger. I'd like to address the challenging topic of population size, primarily due to incomplete data. Let me start with a memory from the mid-1990s advertisements. At that time, one of the popular television channels used the slogan, there are 52 million of us. However, even back then, this number differed from reality. Ukraine's population was 51.5 million during the 1989 population census, when the country was still part of the Soviet Union. This slogan and the figure of 52 million inhabitants seem as if they come from a different reality. Unfortunately, the prolonged period of higher mortality than birth rates, mass emigration, especially of young people, low birth rate, and a complex socio-economic situation have made depopulation a characteristic phenomenon for Ukraine. It's challenging to estimate the current number of Ukrainians permanently residing in the country. Moreover, no one can accurately state how many people lived in our country before the full-scale invasion. Different Ukrainian government bodies, European and international institutions provided estimates that varied from one another. As of February 1, 2022, the State Statistics Service estimated the population of Ukraine, excluding the temporarily occupied Autonomous Republic of Crimea, at 41.1 million people. Meanwhile, according to government estimates, as of December 1, 2019, Ukraine was home to 37.3 million people. This figure did not account for the temporarily occupied territories. Moreover, the annual population decrease in the year prior to the war was over 420,000 individuals. As of January 1, 2022, Eurostat estimated Ukraine's population at 41 million. According to the World Bank, in 2021, Ukraine had a population of 43.8 million people. Similar approximations were presented by the UN. Even by the most conservative calculations, Ukraine's population decreased by more than 8 million over 30 years. Although the demographic crisis began well before the invasion, Russia's war against Ukraine exacerbated the situation, transforming it into what can be termed a demographic catastrophe. Even before the full-scale Russian invasion, nearly 2 million Ukrainians had migrated abroad for work, representing a significant volume of labor migration. These individuals went to Europe for work and ended up settling there. They didn't sever all ties with Ukraine, which is why demographers continue to include them in Ukraine's total population count. The United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs Population Division estimates Ukraine's population in 2023 to be 36.74 million. However, this figure might be somewhat optimistic. According to the Institute of Demography and Social Studies, as of January 1, 2023, Ukraine's population ranged from 28 million to 34 million. Demographers attempted to estimate the population within the country's borders as of January 1, 2022, before the large-scale invasion. The approximate nature of these estimates stems from the lack of precise data on population migration. Another source of information about Ukraine's population could be data from mobile network operators. According to this data, in the summer of 2023, Ukraine's mobile network had 48.3 million active SIM cards. Considering the report from the National Commission for State Regulation of Communications, indicating an average of 143 cards per 100 residents in Ukraine, it can be assumed that no more than 33.8 million inhabitants are within our country's territory. Currently, due to the war, over 6 million Ukrainians are abroad. According to UNHCR estimates cited by the Ukrainian magazine Forbes, around 1.3 million of them are in Russia. A significant number of individuals were forcibly taken out by the Russians. 
there is scant public information available about where these people in Russia were sent, the conditions they are living in, whether they possess documents, etc. The most tragic aspect is that approximately a quarter of this group comprises children. This is a huge problem and the prospects for resolving it remain unclear. Officially, the deportation of over 19,500 Ukrainian children has been confirmed. However, this number is underestimated since counting these children precisely due to the occupation of parts of Ukraine's territory is challenging. According to Ukraine's ombudsman, if Ukraine were to repatriate one child deported by the Russians every day, it would take 55 years to bring them all back. This is happening while the Russian Federation continues deporting new groups of Ukrainian children daily from Ukrainian territories. It's worth recalling that in March 2023, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin based on suspicion of illegally deporting and relocating Ukrainian children. Approximately 5 million Ukrainian citizens have received temporary protection in EU countries. The European Union's Directive on Temporary Protection was swiftly activated, proving crucial in supporting Ukrainian refugees. This move provided Ukrainian refugees the understanding that they were legal residents in the host countries, granted them access to healthcare, and allowed those able to work to enter the labor market. Nearly 2 million Ukrainian displaced persons, 40%, are in two European countries, Germany and Poland. Following are Czechia, 340,000, Spain, 178,000, Italy, 158,000, and Bulgaria, 157,000. The reception of refugees in the US and Canada was significantly lower, 280,000 and 234,500 respectively. The majority of these Ukrainian refugees abroad are predominantly women and children. Many of those who fled to other European countries are now faced with a difficult decision whether to return home to Ukraine, where the conflict is ongoing, or establish roots in the host country, effectively transforming a temporary situation into something more prolonged. It's a highly challenging decision that numerous Ukrainian refugees scattered across Europe must make as the war approaches its two-year mark. On one hand, there's a longing for family and a sense of communal duty toward rebuilding their shattered country. On the other, there's the realization that death and destruction are unlikely to end anytime soon. This choice is further complicated as many European cities offer extensive social support systems and an appealing promise of life without war. In the future, the decision about returning will depend on the duration of the war, on the social and economic policies implemented, and whether Ukraine creates job opportunities and accessible housing. One characteristic feature of Ukrainian refugees, according to researchers, is their maintenance of ties with Ukraine. If host countries exhibit flexibility in allowing them to return home to visit family and their properties, around 39% of refugees surveyed in the EU have been able to do so. It's noteworthy that the opportunity to come home and see the situation firsthand heightens refugees' intentions to return. It's crucial for the displaced to have relevant information to make informed decisions voluntarily to return. However, according to one study, between 1.3 to 3.3 million people may choose not to return home. Regarding the return of refugees, Ukraine's international support is crucial, though there are concerning trends indicating its reduction. It's equally important that reconstruction is already underway. This aids in sustaining hope and motivates both refugees and internally displaced persons to return home. Therefore, the government must identify regions most suitable for short and medium term repatriation and invest in corresponding communities. The more Ukraine's government, the international community and communities themselves can do to restore public services, rebuilding schools, reconstructing community centers, investing in mental health and psychosocial support, the more refugees will want to return home. Consequently, Ukraine will recover sooner. One significant factor that will influence the demographic situation is what happens when hostilities cease and men are allowed to leave the country again. The invasion separated families, causing some couples to postpone plans for having children. will have a compensatory increase due to postponed births, 
but it will be slight. In any case, expecting a significant increase in newborns after the war's end is unlikely. Worse, if the standard of living, healthcare, job market conditions, and the country's overall situation remain poor, many men might leave the country to reunite with their families abroad. Thus, it is quite apparent that socio-economic factors are among the most crucial. In the country, numerous young families are facing challenging financial situations. We are referring to families with multiple children, those raising children with disabilities, as well as single-parent families. Today, even an average family with children risks teetering on the brink of poverty. Losing a job by even one family member in times of economic crisis and inflation makes it difficult to meet the basic needs of children and can have a lasting impact on their future. Therefore, supporting children in Ukrainian realities is of utmost importance. In the context of post-war recovery, attention to vulnerable families is a significant step toward the sustainable functioning of society. This encompasses not only various forms of social assistance payments, such as childbirth allowances or other forms of social support. For instance, Ukraine currently operates the following support system for large families. The state provides the equivalent of 60 euros per month for every third and subsequent child. It must be acknowledged that these are modest payments, to say the least. It is worth noting that there are positive initiatives that somewhat ease the situation with childhood support in Ukraine. However, the lack of a systematic approach diminishes their effectiveness. For instance, since April 2020, mothers no longer have to pay charitable contributions for childbirth. Yet, hospitals critically lack pediatricians, often forcing parents to undergo comprehensive analyses in private clinics and fully pay for medications prescribed by the doctor out of their own pocket. Another government decree is about providing a paid 14-day leave for fathers at the birth of a child. The initiative is genuinely needed. However, only a small number of men can avail themselves of this leave, as earlier, a law was passed allowing employers, in conditions of martial law, to dismiss employees while they are on sick leave or vacation. Questions arise regarding what seems to be a positive government initiative under the Municipal Nanny Program. Again, Instead of developing a network of accessible and high-quality kindergartens, the state encourages an individual approach to solving childcare issues within families, albeit with the involvement of a nanny. Therefore, without adequate and stable funding and attention to existing systems of inequality, even slight positive shifts will not be effective. When planning a family, one of the primary factors is having one's own housing and the ability to provide normal living conditions for a child. Before the invasion, the government's housing policy did not contribute to affordable housing for families with children in the country. There is almost no social housing system in place, and people living in rented apartments are practically unprotected against landlords, risking abrupt changes in lease conditions or eviction at any moment. Effectively, the only option was to acquire property on the commercial market. Limited incomes of average families, let alone low-income families, hindered this. The issue extended to inflated housing prices, where investment demand from affluent buyers fuel at a constant price race. The invasion led to the freezing of many construction sites, particularly in cities close to the front line. In western regions, farthest from combat, speculative demand once again inflated prices. Having a job and stable income is also critical, as child social benefits won't exceed employment income. Concerning secure job positions, the policy of labor law, deregulation we discussed in previous episodes, doesn't instill confidence in wage workers, current or future parents, about tomorrow's prospects. Therefore, one of Ukraine's government priorities after the war should be raising social standards, providing accessible housing and healthcare systems, alongside regulating labor relations. The current trend indicates that Ukrainian citizens living in countries like Poland or the Czech Republic move to more prosperous nations, where workers' rights are better protected and they have no plans to return. However, even if some refugees return, depopulation sadly remains a realistic scenario for Ukraine. Demographers warn that the country's demographic growth potential has been exhausted. 
Researchers are now considering various scenarios for further developments based on the course of military actions and population migration. Some experts hold rather radical forecasts regarding the demographic situation. They believe that if Ukraine doesn't implement a clear policy to repatriate citizens from abroad, the population could decrease to 26 million within 10 years. On the other hand, most developed and developing nations currently experience declining birth rates and demographic crises. They all vie for labor resources from other regions worldwide. Therefore, in addition to what was mentioned earlier, improving Ukraine's demographic situation will involve measures such as attracting migrants from other countries, requiring the creation of favorable conditions for their development and livelihood. Hence, to increase migration into the country, it's essential to enhance living standards and social protection, develop medical and educational systems, and ensure the availability of affordable housing for all those in need of it. This podcast relies on credible sources, which are detailed in the description. For further reference, you can access the materials through the provided links.